Pope is a bit confusing because does it relate to the current Pope who has a name or if it's just the Pope, then it's not really um, identifiable personal data. So examples of personal data then, things that identify us as natural living people, they can be things like our name, surname, our home address, email address, any identification card number like James and I, our um, staff ID cards at university, um, the location data from our mobile phones, uh, our uh, home broadband internet protocol, IP addresses, and the advertising identifier embedded in your smartphone. It wasn't always like this. In the early days, we, the users were in, control because we know the early days of the internet were very noble about sharing knowledge so it's not about knowledge is power it's about sharing knowledge so what changed and when did it change and how did it change and who changed it okay so let's look at some of the big tech some of the big tech companies and how old they Amazon's the eldest in that range. So in 2020, she was 25 years old, Amazon. I don't know why I'm attributing gender to Amazon. But anyway, 25 years old. Google, 22 years old. Instagram is only 10 years old. And now we know from Instagram, children have committed suicide because of the messages that they've received. I know that's not privacy, but that's another issue. Instagram is only 10 years old. Facebook teenager, 16 years old. Twitter, 14 years old. That was in 2020. WhatsApp, 11 years old. So it's it's this, it's this kind of Zoom, eight years. And we know, I know we're using Zoom today, but they did get into trouble as well. Class action for sharing uh, meeting attendance uh, uh, records information with third parties. So, you know, it's this kind of thing that has changed the internet because our data is how these companies, a lot of how these companies make their money because they persuade us to act in a, diff in a certain way that really benefits them and makes us part with our money and everything else. Mobile phone companies as well. So a 2021 article talked about T-Mobile. I used to have T-Mobile. I have Vodafone now, but I'm sure Vodafone are the same. They wanted to begin a new program with their uh, T-Mobile users to start including information about how T-Mobile users uh, were using the web from their devices. Think about that. They wanted to extract information on how they were using T-Mobile platform devices unless the user told them not to. So in other words, the default that T-Mobile were trying to adopt was tracking by default. So you had to tell T-Mobile that you didn't want this third party uh, uh, advertising, which would be done through T-Mobile monitoring um, how you were using the web using their uh, devices. So T-Mobile said in a, in a privacy notice, when we share this information with third parties, it is not tied to your name or information that directly identifies you. That is what they were claiming. However, T-Mobile customers were saying that they had problems trying to opt out because here it says, unless you tell us not to. So in other words, the default was tracking, but uh, customers found it difficult to opt out. So in other words, companies do not make it easy. And I kind of demonstrated this by asking you to play that cookie game, which James found on the internet, because cookie notices and things like this kind of behavior, T-Mobile, do not make it easy for you to opt out for your data being extracted. Google, who here uses incognito mode? Yes or no in chat. I used to use it. I thought it was a great idea. It's a gimmick. So incognito mode in Google's Chrome browser is a gimmick. They are st Google are still spying on you, on your web usage, your web, web navigation, where you go when you choose incognito mode. It is just a gimmick. Google tried to kill a lawsuit about it when it was uncovered that it's just a gimmick. So 
um, even when people using the incognito mode of Google's uh, Chrome, Google was still collecting data about what was happening. And there is a court case file. There's many court, case, court cases filed against Google about all sorts of different things. And one of them is this, that they have uh, really been dishonest, disingenuous about the incognito mode in Google Chrome. So do, do we have any rights against all this? I mean, where are the, the laws to protect us or regulations? Where are they? Do we have anything to protect us? And this is a huge area in artificial intelligence. How do we build ethical AI, trustworthy AI, beneficial AI, responsible AI? How, where, where, how do we even um, get over that challenge? How do, uh, human rights is something that you need to understand language. And you know all these like open AIs, chat GPT, they might give the illusion of understanding, but they're just parrots. So what rights do we have to protecting our data and privacy? Do we have, are these mentioned anywhere? Well, Microsoft CEO, he said that tech companies need to defend privacy as a human right. Yeah, right. Very noble. But what are Microsoft actually doing? This is what they're saying. Well, what are they actually doing? What they're actually doing? They're working with DuckDuck. Go browser, which calls itself, uh, you know, a privacy browser, and Microsoft with DuckDuckGo are getting your data. So DuckDuckGo is sharing uh, data with Microsoft. So DuckDuckGo, which claims to be a privacy browser, I do not use it. I was going to use it before I read this, and I use a different browser. But they've struck a deal, Microsoft. So in other words, they're saying here, this is so the public face. Oh, yes, tech companies need to defend privacy as a human right. But what they're doing behind the scenes, working with um, DuckDuckGo, uh, claiming to be a privacy browser to actually track users and pass that information to Microsoft. I mean, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just really annoying. So what about our human rights? Well, Article 12 in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I'm, I'm, I'm introducing you this because we can't leave it to big tech. Big tech might put out these lovely words. Oh, yeah, big tech companies need to defend privacy as a human right. So we cannot leave it to big tech because what they say and what they do in private are two different things. So we have to go back to where is it stated, codified, that we have human rights to data protection and privacy. So one is in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It includes this statement, Article 12, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his or her privacy or correspondence. And that should go towards online protection as well. So this is codified in the 1948, which was, uh, uh, um, you know, codified after the horrific goings on in the Second World War. Okay, and human rights, where else is it mentioned? Article one of the 2000 EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, it states that human dignity is inviolable. It must be respected and protected. So there's links uh, to that. Another place where human rights are mentioned or, you know, the right to privacy and data protection. The 2018 General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, according to the ICO, who've uh, got lots of uh, really neat little uh, uh, snippets from it to make it easy for us to understand, uh, tell us that the GDPR sets a very high standard for consent. So we shouldn't have to go through what we did uh, playing that cookie consent game to work out how to, um, you know, avoid accepting cookies because we don't know what's in them. Are the good cookies just helping us to store information in, say, a basket if we're shopping so we don't have to keep repeating what we want to put in the basket when we're shopping? Or is it tracking cookies where it's selling our personal data to third parties? So the GDPR sets a high standard for consent, all very noble. Informed consent entails offering individuals real choice and control. But we can see from the cookie game, which those cookie uh, notices, cookie banners are from real websites, that that's not actually happening. So in other words, compliance is not taking place. And genuine consent should put individuals in charge, build trust and engagement. So really for a business, 
to build trust, it needs to uh, offer genuine consent, which would be through transparent, easy to understand, short privacy policies and very quick, easily understandable cookie banners and cookie statements. So from Coventry University's GDPR, uh, of course, again, I'm just doing a screenshot. The GDPR has two main objectives. Protection of fundamental rights and freedoms of individual persons with regard to processing their personal data. And the protection of the principle of free movement of personal data within the EU. So it shouldn't, our personal data shouldn't be sold outside of the without our consent. And we'll give you, I'll give you examples today of where that's happening. And yeah, third party cookies. So this is all quite noble in the GDPR. But what is actually happening on, uh, is that GDPR compliance uh, uh, taking place in websites that are uh, European, within the European uh, territory? Well, let's have a look. Okay, so this is a uh, bing.com and you can argue, well, that's bing.com, but the GDPR does talk about um, the uh, consumers in the UK. So if Bing is processing, Microsoft through Bing, if it's processing uh, data of people within the EU, the GDPR does apply. Uh, we do have uh, uh, lawyers, uh, um, GDPR lawyers on our project, which I'll talk about later, but this is still a very, because GDPR is still quite new as a regulation and compliance, you know, it's still being explored how to get companies to comply. So this is uh, Microsoft admitting, uh, Bing.com, that it uh, uh, gives third party vendors, it allows cookies to allow third party vem vendors to give data to Microsoft about you. So you can uh, see the link there. Uh, Google.com, they tell you that cookies are a vital piece of technology. Yes, we know that. Um, we, we know they're useful to store your um, shopping cart and all that. But, you know, Google is not very helpful in telling us what the cookies are that they use and what happens. And Google Analytics, one of the tools um, that Google freely allows web developers to use and app developers, the data that Google Analytics um, uh, collects might be useful for website owners, organizations, etc. But the data that those organizations have from Google Analytics, like how often uh, a person comes to the website, how long they stayed, which, which page on the website, all that data, behavioral data, also goes back to Google. That's the problem. Um, right, so I'm gonna expose Coventry University now. Anybody here from Coventry University? Anyway, it's not like this. But even Coventry University's website, when I, uh, James and I started the project, uh, in 2020, obviously, the first thing we were going to do uh, uh, in a project that was looking at GDPR compliance in websites and apps was to look at our own university website. So in 2020, this was Coventry University's website. This was the home page. This was the landing page that users came to. What's happening here is that Coventry University, like many of the websites, is using dark patterns. It's using a cookie, it was, sorry, I need to clarify, it was using a cookie wall between the user, visitor of a website, and the information on Coventry University's website. So the users, the visitors could be students looking for a course, uh, uh, academics looking for a job, all sorts of people, as a parents looking, finding accommodation for their students who might be looking at Coventry University as a place to study. So all, all policy makers, all sorts of people. There was this cookie wall and it was using psychological dark patterns. And you'll see this a lot across the Internet, where the dark pattern is that it's psychologically nudging you to accept all. Accept all what? The accept all button, not only is it a different color, it's a different size, larger font than the reject. You can hardly see the reject, which is beneath the manage cookies. So you've got accept all and reject. Why are they a different color button? Why are they a different size uh, uh, font color? Why are they different? Why are they different size as well? This is called dark patterns using psychological uh, 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 behave, this nudging, psychological nudging, to get people to accept all. Accept all what? If you look at the cookie consent notice, it wasn't really transparent about what was going on. 
So because we were leading Coventry University, um, James and I, our, our team were leading an international project looking at this, we had to go to the data protection officer and say, you can't really do this. First of all, it's not complying with the GDPR, the principles of informed consent and transparency. And you're also using dark patterns. You know, th this, is, this is wrong. And the data protection officer, I mean, you know, I'm exposing Coventry University here, but this is a big problem. The, the websites are really controlled by marketing departments and marketing departments, they need data. So the, there's a, a balancing act going on that is really challenging. So we know this, that for web developers and app developers, they need data. And but what do they do? How do they do? collect that data that they need for their business, the business intelligence. How do they do that when they've got this really strong uh, regulation GDPR? So this is a balancing act and this is a big challenge. We realize that, but Coventry University no longer has this uh, because the, the marketing and the data protection officer realize, well, you know, first of all, it's not complying with the GDPR and the 2018 UK Data Protection Act that en encoded the GDPR. It's also embarrassing because Coventry University are leading a project on GDPR compliance in websites and apps. So you'll be happy to know they have changed it. So in uh, 2020, it was like this. And in 2021, you can see they changed it after discussions we had with the data protection officer. You can see now they've got the uh, button sizes uh, are the same color. The text um, is the same size and everything. However, and we did go back, uh, we said, ah, but you still got analytics on a default. So the analytics is still default, which means that the users, visitors to Coventry University's website still have to opt out because the default is opt-in to have your behavioral uh, uh, information, like which, which website did you come from to arrive at Coventry University? How long did you stay? Which pages? on Coventry University website, did you um, stay and all that. So that tracking is in 2021. I'll be honest, I haven't had time since then to check. Hopefully that uh, default has gone. Um, I'll ask my colleagues here to check for themselves or check your own organization's websites to see what's going on. So here's just a few uh, um, a, a link screenshots of other business websites to show you that it's not all Coventry University. Other uh, uh, websites as well use these really lack of transparent uh, notices. For example, Business Insider, we use cookies to create a better experience for you. What does that mean? What kind of better experience? And do I want that experience? Do I want that better experience? Spotify. Spotify tells you we and our partners use cookies to deliver our services. By using our website, you agree to the use of cookies described in our cookie policy. Now, this is not transparent. It's not giving informed consent because it's it's making you uh, by default access, um, uh, sorry, give whatever information they want through cookies because it's saying by default, by using our website, you agree. But th that's not transparency and that is not informed consent because what are the cookies that, the, what cookies are they using? Who is accessing the information collecting from the cookies? And this is this is a, a, a very, um, you'll see this kind of notice on many websites where they say, by using our website, you agree to the use of cookies described in our cookie policy. And you have to link somewhere else to find out what the cookie policy is. Doodle poll, in our project, we don't use doodle poll anymore because it's the same kind of thing. Doodle ask for your consent to use your personal data to just who's got time for this? Honestly, who's got time? And now there's a loo another loophole, which is legitimate interest. So where the cookie notices have got better, companies now are saying they've got a legitimate interest. So you have to be really careful because even if you've switched off cookies, they know you don't accept cookies. Check if the if there's a legitimate interest request because in that legitimate interest. Um, which is a, a loophole because, you know, advertisers and the you know, big companies, uh, uh, they're always trying to find loopholes around regulations to get your data. L legitimate interest, you might find uh, reams and reams of uh, digital reams of uh, uh, 
digital advertisers and marketing companies who claim to have a legitimate interest to extract your personal data from your visit to a, a third party website. So watch out for legitimate interest. And you can see in this website, doodle.com, uh, it's a uh, default on. So you have to go underneath and you have to switch it off. So that is not informed consent because that is default tracking. That's not what's allowed. Now, this to me, you might have found your own worst excuses. This to me is the worst excuse I've seen on a website. And it's a house of.com to buy lovely furniture and stuff. And it says, we use cookies because if we don't use, you couldn't buy stuff. That's what it says. So you, but what cookies? I mean, they should tell you, are there session cookies which are just recording your usage for a session and then that session disappears? Or is it uh, tracking cookies? Who 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 will the uh, information go to from the tracking cookies? So this to me is the worst of the uh, cookie banners because it's like, I mean, this to me is egregious because if we don't use cookies, you couldn't buy stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, yes, I'm not buying anything from you. Thank you very much. But you might find your own worst, worst uh, cases. So now we're going to move to mobile applications so not just websites now so this is uh, uh james uh, working on the uh, e funded project uh, as a creativity manager has come up with some really fab images i think the fab images so we're going to look at what's happening under uh, apps in mobile phones now oh, this one really really shocking so uh, this is before the general data protection regulation came into force in 2018 in the uk uh, there was a collaboration between um, a company called DeepMind. So DeepMind was a startup, an AI startup in London, and it created um, an algorithm called AlphaGo, and it was to play the champion of this game called Go. So it was to play the world champion at Go, and Go is considered um, harder than chess, and chess, a machine had already uh, beaten the champion chess player Gary Kasparov, IBM's D Blue Machine, in 1997. And human versus machine competitions are, are always fun, and uh, um, companies will put big money into them. So uh, Google's uh, DeepMind, this company called DeepMind, they created this uh, AlphaGo. Google bought um, DeepMind, so then they owned the algorithm once AlphaGo had beaten Lisa Doll, the champion of Go. And then uh, the, uh, a lot of these uh, apps, uh, algorithms are being applied in healthcare because health information, personal data, sensitive personal data is really, really lucrative. So Google's DeepMind did a collaboration with uh, a huge hospital in London, the Royal Free uh, Hampstead Hospital NH uh, Trust. The idea was really noble. Nobody's saying it wasn't noble, but what happened was they used the algorithm, DeepMind, Google's DeepMind algorithm, AlphaGo, to create uh, an app to detect kidney disease in patients. Very noble. Nothing wrong with that. Where the problem arose was the hospital gave Google's DeepMind 1.6 million identifiable patients' records without their consent, without telling them, without asking them. So think of that medical data. Your medical data can be tied to your family's data and it's very sensitive data about your health, about your sexuality, your what medication you might be on, what operations. That is called sensitive medical data. And there are even more protections of medical sensitive data than personal data. So the, the data from the hospital, it went outside London without the patient's uh, knowledge, went outside the UK and it went to Google in the US. There is a big court case about this, so you can read about it. Um, two journalists, uh, Julia Powell and Hal Hudson, they wrote about it in The Guardian and in a uh, scientific peer-reviewed uh, paper so you can have a read about this so, so this is what is happening how can the hospital how can the data protection officer of the hospital in 2016 2017 when there was a 1998 uk data protection act in force not think about asking the patients can we pass your data 
to this third party, a big tech company in Silicon Valley, California. Just think about it. how could the data protection officer, the IC or information commissioner's office, who are the UK regulator for data protection, they, they just slapped um, the hospital on the wrist. Now there is a big court case because the data went outside the UK without the patient's knowledge. It's wrong. This is happening a lot. The problem is these companies like Google, they have data breaches. And if they don't protect uh, the data that they collect, especially sensitive me medical data, that data can be sold on the dark web and it can be used for all sorts of uh, malicious purposes like blackmailing you, um, uh, cloning your identity, creating a bank account, um, stealing your uh, uh, funds. So another app, you might have heard of Babylon Healthcare app, and their mission is uh, to put an accessible and affordable health service in the hands of every person on earth. What, really? In sub-Saharan Africa? Yeah, really? Um, in, I mean, it's just nonsense. The people behind Babylon are a hedge fund. This is not about delivering healthcare. And what is underneath the Babylon healthcare app, which allows you to talk to a private doctor? So you can pay money through, um, uh, it says through uh, uh, the NHS, it's not free. So you go through the app to speak to a GP. What is underneath the Babylon app? Well, no surprise, it's got Facebook login tracker. Why? Why is Facebook login tracker in this healthcare app to speak to a GP? Why should Facebook know when you log into this app? So not only is there a Facebook tracker, as well as these other trackers, Google Firebase, Google Crashlytics, and Apps Fire and Mixed Panel, which was the, the app was endorsed by Matt Hancock, the former UK Secretary of State for Health. And so the less said about him, the better. But he endorses because a lot of the politicians today are very interested in AI, artificial intelligence. But when it comes to AI, what they're really interested in is data. That is not AI. But beyond just the tracking in this Babylon app, it's got Facebook login trackers, it allowed a data breach because it didn't protect the app. It didn't safeguard the app in development. So people using the Babylon app, they could see the consultations of other Babylon users with GPs. Think about that, that you can see a video recording of somebody else's consultation with a doctor because the app had no safeguarding to protect your consultations, your private medical consultations. Think about that. This is the problem with collecting uh, all the data. These companies, whether it's Facebook, Google, Babylon app, hedge fund who is behind it, they don't put uh, uh, money into cybersecurity to protect either the websites so that they're not hacked or apps. This is one of the main problems. So this is why we need to protect our data in whom we give our data to, when, why, for how long? Livy app is another one, which is an app to speak to a GP and you pay your money uh, and all that. Again, it's got trackers in it. It's got seven trackers, including Amazon Analytics, Google Analytics, Snowplow Tracker, which is a behavioral data analytics. Why? Why is this happening? And when you speak to web developers and uh, colleague here today, if somebody comes to them with a requirement, they're, they're bound to follow the requirements. So where does ethics come into it and safeguarding come into it? If a company comes to a web developer and an app developer and say, these are our requirements, what is a web developer and app developer supposed to do? Are they supposed to say, well, how much money are you going to put in cybersecurity? If I develop this app, it's going to cost you this much extra for cybersecurity to secure the data so that um, there's less chance of the data being breached. And do you really want to give the users of your app their data to these uh, third parties? What's a web developer and an app developer meant to do? So this is something in universities we need to, uh, you know, educate our uh, students who are studying web and app development that they need to put safeguarding at, at the forefront but is, is that even possible is it even a a, a a challenge that they can overcome if the requirements of a company are that we want these trackers in there because we also get that data that goes to google amazon facebook whatever so yeah livy app 
has got all these permissions, access to your uh, the memory card of the mobile phone. You can have a look at your, this yourself by uh, the free uh, tools to manage your um, uh, data. So uh, an article by Good 2018 said mobile apps. So it's not just Facebooks. They, they hoover up a hell of a lot of uh, uh, data about your interactions through websites, uh, uh, through apps, sorry, um, through your usage of apps and what other apps you use. They, they can hoover up a hell of a lot of data about what you're doing using the app. So, and that is not just Android apps like Google, Apple as well. Apple is mostly uh, um, tracking data, or collecting data for itself. At least it's not selling it to third parties, but it's still collecting data as a first party collector. Android, for all anybody can facebook anybody can have so have a look at that and and these are all types of uh, apps on your uh, phone that you might have on your phone so uh, we know that you have to have some uh, permissions for apps in a phone so for example i live in london uh, i live here on the hill so i need to know when the bus is coming to take me to the metropolitan line tube station down in harrow town so i know i have to give my location to that uh, London bus timetable app. It needs my location to give me um, uh, the time the bus is coming so I can manage my time when I leave home to get the uh, bus to the tube station. However, should that bus, uh, London bus timetable app have access to my contacts, my messages, my photographs? Absolutely not. So I have to make sure that the permissions in that London bus timetable app only have access to my location that function which is necessary for the app to work. And this is because I know now, whereas this is what we need to do is to check the permissions on apps. It's a laborious process, but we do need to know that. Otherwise, the, um, you know, the uh, uh, microphone uh, uh, on your phone, it can hear what you're saying and then send you recommended apps. So you do need to uh, uh, be aware of how to set permissions in your phone for apps so they only have permissions to those features in your smartphone that allow the app to work and they're not taking extra information. So nobody's saying WhatsApp shouldn't have access to your photograph because if you're sharing photos and videos with your friends on WhatsApp, then it needs access to the, the, the features to um, attract, uh, sorry, take uh, photos and videos. So the internet, according to Privacy International, is plagued with trackers. So I'm going to come to the uh, end, I'll, I'll, I'll stop soon. The internet is a cesspit of surveillance, according to uh, Professor Arvin Narayanan at Princeton University. And he's done a big project where um, they looked at, they used machine learning to look at a million websites to see the amount of tracking in the website. So you can go to his uh, uh, Google Scholar page and have a look. So the problem is huge and it's not going away anytime soon. And you can see, um, you know, documentaries like The Social Dilemma, where you hear the Silicon Valley people and what their noble ideas were for all this, but what's happened, what's actually happened. So um, just coming back to Google again, there is a, a 17 uh, states in uh, the US case against Google because uh, what Google do in private is different from what they try to portray about themselves. So this is a, a court document that I've screenshot from a court case, page 64 of the court case. Paragraph 175 in the court document says, Google presents a public image of caring about privacy, but behind the scenes, Google coordinates closely with the big tech companies to lobby the government to delay or destroy measures that would actually protect users' privacy. Think about that. Google Analytics and GDPR, well, the Austrian Data Protection Authority have already uh, uh, stated that Google Analytics is violating the general data protection regulation. So there's a link there if you want to follow that. And then I mentioned, I think I might have mentioned before the seven o'clock start, um, that you know you, these big companies like Facebook, they can pay these huge fines. It doesn't matter to them. So Meta, the, uh, the parent of Facebook in the US uh, have been fined 725 million for allowing Cambridge Analytica, a third party, to extract 85 million users' data. And that was for the manipulation uh, in the US uh, 2016 
elections. So you can, there's a link there to read that. But Facebook doesn't care. In the EU, the EU have fined Meta Facebook 380 million. And that's just recently. Look, 2023. The other one was late 2022. This is 23. Again, it's, it doesn't matter to Facebook. They, they, they just don't care. This, this fine is nothing to them because they make billions. So what can we do? What can we do? Well, the EU um, luckily gave Coventry University uh, a grant to try and do something. So Coventry University lead an international uh, project, uh, which is rather than big tech trying to change big tech behavior, this is a bottom up project where we are informally educating the general public it, through like this, this kind of talks and going out to cafes, libraries, etc., talking to people to make them aware of what's happening in websites and apps, especially because children have rights. Do parents know how much their children are being tracked through educational uh, websites or children's games? So what we've been doing is across Europe, we've been recruiting citizen scientists. So we've been informally educating them and then training them about informed consent and the principle of uh, transparency and asking them to explore the websites and apps they visit and investigate them for uh, the number of uh, cookies uh, or tracking technologies that are beneath. So we've, we've um, um, over 600 people have completed our free informal education course called Your Right to Privacy Online. It's in five short steps which you can complete in uh, under half uh, a day and the first step is well what is this concept of privacy second step what exactly is personal data step three how is our data being extracted across the internet step four what are our rights step five all the free tools that are available to better manage your data so you are not leaking personal, private, especially sensitive uh, data. So what we've done already, what we've achieved already is we've raised awareness of the rights accorded in the General Data Protection Regulation. We've increased the scientific literacy of European citizens because we've spread the word quite far. We've got uh, partners from Israel to Spain, from uh, the Czech Republic down to uh, Finland and in between. And so our volunteers have already contributed their investigations, uh, which James here um, produced from those investigations to databases that are published on our CSICOP website. Uh, one is of the websites that the citizen scientists investigated, and one is a database of the apps that our citizen scientists investigation investigated. What we're doing is we're going to put these investigations together, the two databases, into an online repository um, that should be available in May, which our uh, subcontractor, uh, brilliant guy, um, is innovating right now, available in May, so that uh, we will launch it on the website and people can search did a website they visit, like a news website or a healthcare app they use? What Did it feature in our citizen scientist investigations? So the investigations are in different languages because our partners are all over. So you'll be able to search. This is what our subcontractor um, is designing in a really fantastic, brilliant way right now. So there are free tools available to check websites. There isn't a standard tool, but there are free tools. So maybe this is something that IEEE or BCS, that they could work on, you know, standardization of cookie notices, privacy policies, and standard tools to help people better protect their data and their children's data. So here are some links to uh, free tools that show you, and I've shown you some uh, uh, under investigations. I used a web call for websites when I was showing you what was underneath websites and for um, Android uh, apps, Exodus Privacy. If you put in an app, it will tell you what trackers are underneath. And then there's another um, uh, little system called Tracker Control that you can download on your uh, phone and that will tell you what trackers are in all the other, it will give you a report of what tracking is going on in the different apps you've got on the phone. So there's a link if you want to use that. And then browser, I've now started using Brave browser, don't use incognito mode anymore in uh, Chrome, I use Brave browser. And in fact, 
uh, the data protection officer of Brave Browser. He was a subcontractor on our CSI COP project funded by the EU and helped us to create that free informal education course in five short steps, uh, Your Right to Privacy Online. I also now use Proton Mail. I'm trying to stop using Gmail for my uh, personal emails. I've started to use Proton Mail. Um, so yes, basically I'm coming to the end. We want general public to become informed citizens. Um, the, the free course, Your Right to Privacy Online is in English and 12 translations, uh, European languages as well as Hebrew, and it can be downloaded uh, from our website for free. Uh, we also publish regular newsletters, the latest one or the last one, the ninth newsletter. Um, it features, um, you know, news about our project as well as uh, the ninth newsletter has an interview from one of our citizen scientists and why he joined the project, why he thought it was uh, uh, important to learn more about how to protect his data online, why privacy online was important to him. The, the um, latest newsletter also announces we won a, a, a big award. Uh, Best Innovative Privacy Project Award in December at a swanky uh, ceremony uh, on Park Lane, Hotel Park Lane in London. We won the Best Innovative Privacy Project beating in the same category Nokia, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Information Commissioner's Office, the UK Cabinet Office and King, the makers of Candy Crush game. So we're pretty, we're pretty proud of that. So just to end then, be proactive. Take back what little free will that we have in this life to control what data we give away to whom, why, when, and for how long. Don't allow erosion of our right to privacy. We do have rights to, of privacy. It's not, privacy is not a privilege. So we need to learn how to protect our human rights because it, they are related to our human dignity. So I'm now going to give you the results of the polls. See if I can remember which, which, yes, oh, it's in this first, yeah, I've got, ah, okay, cool, cool, cool. Can you see my screen, people, to see the results? Can you just? It's just loading at the moment. Yeah, I, I just, I, I shouldn't have pressed that, I just thought. Okay, so that's, can you see the screen? Yes. So 38% said yeah, but 50%, so half of you said and sure need to know more that's really really good so i hope those of you who uh, were unsure want to know more will have a look at our free information uh, informal education course your right to privacy online thank you to the 13 percent who said is privacy dead no so thank you uh, and that's really it thank you for um listening um so i guess this is now just any questions now thank you for listening uh, and that's it thank you for your time Um, so over to John, I guess now. Over to John. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Uma. Um, let's get the camera starts up. Right. I don't know if anybody's got any questions. Um, if you have, I suggest you unmute yourself and ask. Sure. Yes, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Give me your um, name. What's your name? Sorry. Olivia. Olivia. Hi, Olivia. Good evening, Olivia. Thank you very much. Um, I understand, let's say, marketing uh, departments will use um, cookie tools so they can make sure that when they are doing it, they can say to their readers that, oh, yes, we are compliance because we have a cookie, something like cookie bot or plausible or something like that, those kinds of tools. How are they in terms of compliance to, to GDPR? I understand plausible is one that doesn't send cookies to google analytics uh, but not others olivia i've not heard of plausible so it so it's a bot a cookie bot well I, i've not heard of plausible i haven't come across, sorry it's a tool so it's mm -hmm. i haven't come across it so when you say it's okay. a tool so what exactly is it for because this is new to me so that thank you for this because we can and now plausible. investigate and yeah, plausible. Okay. so so what are they so what exactly are they on websites they, or in Yes, you. If your marketing team, you put it on your website, and it, it lets right. your readers know that the cookies you have are compliant. 
oh well these are news to me are plausible and I, oh, okay. I thank you very much because i've i've not come across them and i mean you know i use the internet daily so i've not come across them so that's interesting thank you for that james okay. will you please oh. record that? will you please re so it was plausible and what was the other one uh cookie bot cookie bot okay no we will those. It's so, in the questions. I put it in the questions. So can you chat. give me an example of a website that they are on? So that I haven't seen them on BBC or Guardian. Can you give me an example of a website that they are on? Uh, this is what I hear, so I can't. Yeah. Okay. It's a, they're commercial. And I think they're commercial, so they're not okay. free. So we will invest it because of the, of the we've we've investigated many websites like between the a citizen scientists over 1200 and then the teams as well we the, the different partners team members we've investigated yeah we haven't come across and someone yet. okay and someone has just put their address yeah, Tristy has just now. put it on okay thank thanks you. Tristy. we will okay. investigate well, that. we will okay i may contact you i may contact you then the, later to see what you come up with thank you yeah sure of course because we can update uh, we already updated the fee informal education course one so when it was uh, first released in 2020 because this is a very fast moving area we updated it last year 2020 sorry we the first one was launched in 2021 we updated it last year in 2022 the project ends this year we're going to update it one more time to make it relevant for at least another year beyond the end of the project so we can add uh, knowledge that we've learned from you today so thank you very much for that we will look at these um, systems to see um, what websites they're on and what they do and whether they do comply with the GDPR. Yeah, that's the question I'm asking. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I will I find out. Thank you. One of them, I understand one of them does not send cookies back to Google Analytics, but you have to pay for it. You, you mean pay, it doesn't send personal data from the cookies back to Google? Well, if Google well, Analytics... Yeah, You're if, that, so I appreciate that too. So yeah. yeah, so if Google Analytics is not used on a website, then it won't send the data back. So on our website, so I don't know but if most I marketing, I think most marketing website, most websites will have that. Well, because ours doesn't. Website. So so if I show oh, you okay. our website, so we are okay. privacy by design. Can you see my screen? Yes. So our project website, CSI Cop, um, and. Our um, subcontractor, brilliant subcontractor, I think is here. So he's he helped us create this privacy by design. So what he had to do was reverse engineer um, WordPress to create this website. So he had to extract wow. the embedded cookies. So we don't use Google Analytics. So what Venkat did, who, I think he is here today. What he did, he's created a no tracking cookie counter. So when um, we go on, our website to see how many people are um, looking at, say, for example, project results. So let's have a look, for example, uh, the website database that people created. Let's have a look at our citizen scientists. So if we look at that, what Venkat, um, our 162, that is not using Google Analytics. Most websites do use Google Analytics to give you this kind of uh, information about how many people have viewed a website. So what Venkat did, he's created a no tracking counter. So we don't know these views by people, where they came from, where they're going next, how long they stayed here, where, whereas Google Analytics does do that. So if, um, if, you, if you're saying a website claims that it's not sending data back to Google Analytics, and that's because Google Analytics is not embedded in the website. It is not embedded. Is no. So saying? in other words, yes. Yeah. So Google Analytics can only send back details to Google if Google Analytics is embedded in the website. That makes sense. Yeah. But now one of these, I think plausible, I understand, is something that even if they were embedded, it doesn't send it back. So that's, I would welcome your, your oh, research yeah, we'll, on that. Yeah, we'll have a look. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. So if Google Analytics is embedded and then there's a blocker on top, which in one of my earlier slides, I showed that these uh, blockers, they're ineffective. But we will have a look at the two that you mentioned okay. because I've not heard of those. Yeah, one of them does send it back, but uh, plausible supposedly, I hear, it doesn't, but. Okay, we'll Thank investigate. You, yeah. Yeah, we'll investigate. Thank you. Thank you and, for that, the Olivia. Other, the other increasingly on websites, you have 
deny all or reject all, which seems very easy, like, oh, great, saving me a lot of time. Is that truthful? Uh, not always. So we, uh, um, uh, University College London's uh, Dr. Michael Beale is very big in this area of data protection and the amount of tracking. He came to give us a talk at the British Library, our team, and he told us that even when you think you're rejecting cookies, the algorithm is not rejecting. The algorithm is created to uh, deceive you into believing that you've rejected all, but the algorithm is actually tracking you. It's shameful what's happening. It's because there's no standardization. There's no, because web development and app development, these have been going on for years. G GDPR is still quite a new regulation. That's why the EU gave us this uh, fund to um, what we're doing is using the general public as citizen scientists to investigate GDPR compliance in websites and apps. And what we're finding is there's very little compliance going on. So where is that algorithm? I apologize, I'm monopolizing, but I'm hoping it's helpful to others. Where is it that is. algorithm? Where is that algorithm? And if I push reject and deny, but how can I, I can't get at that algorithm, right? That's behind no, the no. scenes. Well, the, the, what is an algorithm? It's a step-by-step -step process. So mm -hmm. cookies are created from step-by-step -step process, an algorithm. So you can't get to the algorithm. You, it's the cookie. The cookie is founded on algorithms. So when you reject a, um, a cookie, um, it, we have to look at ways that if you're really rejecting a cookie, is the website really rejecting tracking? So the, the only way we can really do this is, is from standardization, where we get web developers and app developers to follow a code. So this is you know, something that we are heading to. We're heading towards, with this project, recommending to the EU who have funded us that we need to start having standardization in web and app development because we are being deceived. Even if we reject cookies, the algorithm is, is uh, you, you press reject, but the algorithm ignores that. It still tracks you. All there's legitimate interest. All, there's, all these yeah. other cookies with different names. So if you have a good app or web developer, or let's say good app developer, can they work ours, on that and, and check? Yeah, ours, yeah, our, our sub, is he here? Uh, Venka, if our subcontractor, Venka is, he, he did our website. He uh, created a privacy by design, no tracking. So if you look at the cookie notice on our website, it is truthful. If you go to the privacy policy of our website, it's very simple. So how do I show the bottom? So um, if, if you see the bottom of our website, uh, James, will you give the link so people can go? It says CSI COP does not use any cookies that analyze tracking. We, we don't track you at all. So it's because we as, um, uh, as an organization, CSI COP as a, a, a project, we gave these requirements to an expert uh, um web developer and he's, he does a hell of machine learning and all that. We gave requirements that we don't want tracking. We want a website that does not track and we want to create a simple that tells people what cookies are, what the different types of cookies are, but let them know we're not using any tracking cookies. We're only using those cookies that allow the page to the web pages to work the website to work, not tracking. We do not allow any third party tracking whatsoever. Those are those it's like the essential cookies. Yeah, so only those only essential that, let, yeah, that make the website work. So in other words, that was our requirements to this uh, machine learning expert and web developer. Those were our requirements. So in other words, the challenge is or, um, you know, the, the industry, web developers, are not, and they are our stakeholders whom we are I'm educating young ones in Coventry University, students, web developers and app developers who study computer science. So they do those modules. We're, we're educating them to, you know, look at safeguarding, users data. What is the purpose of your app? Who's going to use it? Is it children? How are you going to safeguard their uh, data. Are you going to check if there's embedded trackers in the development environment, whether it's Android? So we are doing that, but we're just one organization. We need a bottom-up revolution, and that's what the CSI COP project is, a bottom-up revolution, getting the general public involved, saying, hey, check yourself, the websites you use, the apps you use.
uh, does that <laughs> really long answer? Does that answer your question, Olivia? So uh, you're helpful. I hope it was helpful to others. So thank you, John. Yeah, and your questions are. Your questions were very good. Thank you. And then for the information you gave us, we'll definitely investigate those two tools. So, um, anything else? We hope um, people go to our website and, and, and look at the results. So, for example, look at the um, databases. You can download them of the app investigations. So the apps that our citizen scientists um, investigated. So we will be putting these two databases together in a repository but please do feel free um so james will you put these in the the app investigations in the chat so the databases and then the website investigation uh the um database is this link yep so feel free to um download the uh, databases they're, they're just in excel they're very easy to um look through and you can explore um does the website you visit often, did it feature in um, our investigations by our citizen scientists or is an app that you use, was that investigated by our citizen scientists? So you can find out by downloading the Excel file that's got all the information. So it tells you uh, the name of the website, the type of the website. So in this case, app, the name of the app, type of app. So was it a news, was it health? you know, was it whatever kind of, uh, was it a game? So you can check what language was it in? Because, you know, we have citizen scientists from across Europe and in Israel. So you can check all that. It's it's really interesting. We've been uh, giving these links on LinkedIn and people have been downloading. We've also put them up on Zenodo, open access platform, and people are downloading these databases. Yeah. Uh, so... So is this, yeah, so anything, any other questions? Would anybody be interested in completing our free course? Um, your right to, if you are, you can download it from this link. Uh, James, will you please put this in chat? So this is the link, so what, what, I've done today is just truncated what is in this course, Your Right to Privacy Online. It's available in English and 12 translations. So you can download the English document uh, from here, or you can download the, uh, if you speak one of these languages and would like to look at it, complete it. You get a lovely certificate that James here has, uh, has created to get a lovely um, CSI COP EU certificate to say you completed the course because there are 10 multiple choice questions so after completing the five steps um, you can um, complete 10 multiple choice questions to see to test your knowledge and uh, then you can ask for a certificate lovely certificate in formal education but it's, it, it's a nice looking certificate. anybody here interested i wonder if i can look at chat and have a look if anybody's oh thanks uh Thanks, James, for putting that uh, link in. Yeah, James is marvellous. And we also have Venkat. I think, Venkat, are you here? I don't know if Venkat wants to say anything about uh, requirements following. Um, he's our genius subcontractor, like James here. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, uh, I'm here, yeah. Hi, Venkat. So if anybody wants to ask a question to Venkat. So Venkat is our subcontractor. So he reverse engineered WordPress to create CSI Cops Privacy by Design website so if anybody is interested in uh, privacy by design to build trust with your customers and your users then, then and where will yeah. the um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah so if anyone has a question if no one um so so Mar sorry go on olivia go on Have I frozen? Am I frozen or is Olivia frozen? Am I frozen? Uh, I think Olivia's frozen. I can't hear her. Oh, right. Okay. Okay, while we're waiting for Olivia, has anybody else got anything they would like to? Hi, uh, yeah, it's uh, Adrian. Hope you can hear me. 
Yeah, I can. Hi, Adrian. Good evening. Excellent. Um, good evening. It's, it's been a really interesting talk and I, I love the idea and the work that you're doing. Um, Thank you. In conversations with many of my friends around this stuff, and I must admit, I'm, I'm the person that everybody says is the privacy person and everyone then ignores me when I start going off on my soapbox. <laughs> Um, the, the usual response is that so along the lines of handing over this data is the price you pay for the, the free internet and the, the free services that we use. What would be your response to that sort of question or comment? Well, uh, I can uh, I can understand that, but a lot of the internet is not free, is it? Like, you know, if you want to read the Times, an article on the night, Times is behind a paywall. So why has Times got trackers underneath as well as charging you? So uh, a lot of the internet is not free. Um, and what I would say is that um, you know, it's it's like that lady. I don't know if you saw um, the TED talk by the Hollywood actress. A really short video. It's like, um, why would you want to share your personal data with people that you don't know and you don't know what they're going to do with it? Especially because there's a lot of maliciousness going on. You know, for example, and this is not even new, even when I was doing my PhD, um, a chatbot emerged, a cyber lover in 2007, and it was using uh, uh, malicious developers using the Turing test uh, uh, paradigm where uh, the cyber lover chatbot fooled people into thinking that they were speaking to a human, uh, extracted data from them, their uh, bank account. We humans are really trusting. We really trust. We think other people are as honest as we are. So we need to um, get stronger to get, uh, and to be less trusting. So that's what I would say is that, if, especially if you have children or you have nephews, do you care about their data? Do you care about you know, adults pretending to be children going into children's apps? And this is happening. And earlier I explained there was a, a Sunday Times last year, this time last year uh, in February, uh, an app called Yubo, Y-U-B-O, Sunday Times, two journalists, they did an investigation of a, the Yubo app uh, created by a French company. And it's an app that allows teens, 13 to 17, to make friends across the internet. Unfortunately, the way the app is developed, there are no safeguards for what age a person can go in there. And the it was not unexpected that a paedophile got caught attacking, you know, and it was reported in the Manchester Evening News. So I would say that is our is our personal life, is it so like um, anybody can have it? Do we, I mean, I would say if you don't care about your data, you might really um, be upset one day if your data, your identity is cloned, and your bank account is like, you know, all the money is stolen from your bank account. So just because it hasn't happened to you doesn't mean that the, the big tech and the internet, you know, the companies on there care about your privacy. Because if that were the case, there wouldn't be all these court cases against Google, all these massive, massive fines against Meta. So I would say, um, do you care? about your data i mean you know if you think al it's too late all my data is out there you know like uh, open ai's chat gpt which takes text and spurts it out when people ask it questions so it's just like a large chatbot or clearview ai that without people's permission it took millions billions of photographs from the internet put it into um you know a, um, a system and then sold it to uh, law enforcement agencies for facial recognition. It is, I would say, care about your dignity, your privacy, your data. If you think it's too late, try using a, a privacy browser like Brave. Try um, um, a, a different email. So I've started to use Proton. I don't use Facebook anymore since I started this project. I'm not on Facebook anymore. I'm not on WhatsApp anymore. The problem is these platforms are very good for bringing people together. We cannot deny that Facebook is a great platform, you know, for activism and everything. So we need this bottom up approach where uh, individuals, we come together and, and, and we, we, we lobby government say enough is enough, enough. And we know that governments are working on this. The UK has an online crime bill 
which they're trying to put together something, which is to protect us and children because of what's happening. So I would put it that it's our human right to, um, I would say to them, it's our human right. And if you don't care about your dignity and then go ahead, carry on. But you know, we have to say that in a polite way. Yes, thank you. No, but thank you for that question, Adrian. I'm really glad that you're a privacy champion. We'd love you to be on board our project. So do contact James and myself. Is Olivia still here? Uh, oh, so Olivia's gone. I yeah. just, just this. So, so Olivia got another question. Yeah, I came there. back. Yeah, I came back. Sorry, uh, my um, browser, my computer went off. <laughs> Did check the battery. Um, so you had a question for our colleague oh, Venkat. Oh, um. Oh yes, uh, I think I was starting that marketing companies, if they want the type of information that goes back to Google Analytics, this goes back again, I'm not sure the question I need to ask. Marketing companies want all that kind of information, some of them, yeah, they wanna know all the details. So can they get that without using, without it going back to Google Analytics? Yeah, just don't use Google Analytics. Yeah, if, yes, if, Olivia. Um, sorry, Huma. Um, yes. This is Venkatesh, Olivia. So if any company or any marketing agencies, if they are in need of um, the information or behavior of the users of their website, they can get that information by anonymizing the data. They don't have to know uh, particularly the user information. They can build their own uh, analytics with the information that they can store with them and they can anonymize the data and they can get the behavior of the users without actually knowing them. So uh, for example, if I'm going and visiting a shopping site and if they wanted to see my behavior on their site, yes, businesses still need that information to improve their business or to improve the user experience. But in order to get that, they don't have to know me exactly who I am or where I'm from. So they can anonymize my data and still uh, they can uh, get the information and how much time I can spend and what are the products I'm interested in and uh, what are my tastes in selecting the products. They can get that information without actually knowing me. It dip, like Huma mentioned, it actually depends on what are the requirements and what they are giving the developers to track or to make a cookie to get that information. First, businesses have to have an idea what they want and what they don't want. Hope that answers your question. The, the yeah, problem is, so they can customize their they customize the, the cookie. I mean, can they? Yes. You know, developers these days they they download stuff from internet repositories. You know, is there some good cookies already? And that goes. But they can create their own. They can. They can create so, their own thing. People will go to Google Analytics or any other. Uh, bigger analytical tools just because of the ease of use and less cost. If uh, mm -hmm. people wants to build their own cookies, it might cost a little bit extra money for them and a little bit more maintenance to avoid those maintenance costs and extra uh, money or time spent on the development of these customized cookies. They are going for the third party tools. So still they can uh, build their own ones without actually sending this information to any third party vendors. The problem that we are having with using Google Analytics and any other third party analytical tools is that we are getting the information we need, but in the background, this information is being sent to the uh, third party uh, agreements that Google is already having. So they will sell this data without actually we are knowing that or any other businesses are knowing that information is being sold to the third parties through Google mm -hmm. Analytics. And, and the problem is, what is the tool, process, product that you're marketing? So, for example, uh, menstruation apps. Uh, uh, there was an investigation uh, done on in, uh, menstruation apps. So, obviously, menstruation apps, um, they will, will want to send you, uh, sell females, uh, you know, painkillers, things like that. So, the marketing then will want to know, you know, your... And, and, your monthly, you know, dates and everything, and then, and then to target you at those times to sell you products. 
the thing is, the, the investigations of those, uh, the, the 36 men, uh, Privacy International did it. I mean, the, I can send you the links if you email me. Um, they found lots of trackers in there, like Facebook. So if you're marketing and you're marketing a product or a process, first of all, you, you I think we have to think about this ethically. What is the purpose uh, of the marketing? What is it you're selling? Is it just you're getting information to launch a product? What is it? What is the purpose? You know, you have to think of what the purpose is. And then you have to think of what are you yeah. gaining? What are you gaining? Are you gaining trust if you um, uh, pay a little bit more for requirements for a no tracking cookie? But it gives you uh, a sufficient anonymous, uh, uh, anonymized information data about a person to be able to provide a service to that person. What are you gaining? by allowing third parties like Amazon Analytics, Google Analytics, Facebook login. What are you as a marketing company gaining by giving these third parties? I don't know because I don't use them. Marketing companies need to think like, uh, uh, you know, they need to think what are they gaining? Because what you will gain by not giving these third parties that data is trust with your customer. Because what we're doing in our project is exposing the amount of tracking and what we're finding with our citizen scientists is how shocked they are and how they're losing trust in organizations they were using. I don't use BBC website anymore because of the amount of tracking. First of all, it's a BBC, it's a UK television. Uh, uh, we pay license to it and it's got a server in the US. And if you look at um, uh, any free tool and see where the data goes to from when you uh, pop to the BBC website, and if you look at the map of where your data goes, a lot of it to the US. Why? And that's BBC. UK, you know, license uh, pairs, uh, we, we pay license to the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. So I've lost trust in the BBC website. I won't go there. So that's something that these, I mean, obviously millions still go to BBC, but we're exposing through our project what's, what's happening. Have you spoken with someone at the BBC to ask who, why that is? Can they no, not because a that's, no, because that is not our uh, project. Uh, we we have oh, okay, okay. certain deliverables and tasks. Oh, okay, what we okay, will okay. do, but our final project um, e uh, event, um, our final uh, outcome, um, we will be exposing this um, through our uh, main event in Brussels to the EU. We're EU funded, so we will expose uh, uh, what's going on and then hopefully journalists will be interested to see um, our, our, our databases and our repository, the which news websites had the most trackers, which, you know, health app had the most third party tracking going on. So it's not for us to speak to them. We, we can't change the world just one project at a time. We will let journalists interview the BBC and say, why have you got all this? What about the which consumer report? company what about it they might be interested maybe they're well, interested in well, their stakeholders. the way you they, they oh, are okay. stakeholders so they would uh, oh, okay. we would invite people or we would make aware when okay. we have our stakeholder uh, some okay. of the events that we have planned our stakeholder cafes where policy makers journalists and we're, we're holding these all across europe and in israel so they're invited to come to us. We're not, not going to go individually. We will use un our university's marketing team to say, hey, we've got these stakeholder cafes. If you're a policymaker, you're a web developer, or you're uh, a consumer organization, or whatever, you can come and talk to us. Because can you imagine going one-to-one -to, -one to BBC or to WIT? It's just not possible. It's, it would take too long. Okay, so I think we're coming up to... Thank you, Olivia. Really good questions, Olivia, and thank you. Um, any any more, anything else in chat, James? Um, otherwise, I think we're coming to the end of the half hour. Um, Triska has put uh, very similar to, um, you know, so talking about privacy ratings. So um, for, they've used which as an example, you know, which best product for this. Um, so one that could be applied to consumer protection or consumer rights to privacy, similar to how we discussed before about proposing some sort of badge to say, yeah, this website is. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, yeah. This is what we're uh, we're heading to. When we uh, compl complete our project, we'll have a better idea of what's going on. So we will recommend to the EU because it's the EU who funded us uh, standardisation uh, of uh, privacy policies and cookie banners so that they're more transparent and easier. So that is where we're heading to. Privacy ratings is a good idea. Privacy. One of our partners uh, in Finland has suggested a privacy badge like Trustpilot. Um, you know, things like that. So these are things that we're looking at. So the legacy of the project, what can the EU implement? Right now, what the EU have asked us to do is uh, we submitted a, the first policy recommendation. Uh, we recommended that the EU, at least the projects that they fund, because what we found in our, um, in our investigations, the EU funded projects, their websites have tracking. Uh, E-funded projects that use apps, they use app developers that have tracking uh, in the apps. So what we've uh, recommended to the EU is that at least EU-funded projects, EU should be able to, uh, you know, compel the funding the f that they give to organizations. They should be able to compel those organizations to ensure safeguarding uh, in the websites that they create from EU-funded project websites and apps. So that, that's something that we, that's already been accepted by the EU. So uh, I'm in the middle of well, trying to find time to write the guidelines. So the EU have ac accepted the policy recommendation because that is something that they can implement to improve GDPR compliance. To say to EU project websites, uh, because they already do this with respect to ethics, that will you have an ethics uh, responsible research? Will you apply ethical research? So they can also say, how will you comply with the GDPR in your project? Will your website be privacy by design? So this is something that you have already accepted from the CSI COP project, the first policy recommendation. And you can read it, it's in our project results page, uh, also on Zenodo, CSI COP's first policy recommendation. And the final recommendations will be moving towards standardization. But it's a big challenge because businesses need data. So this is where we stakeholders need to come together. Consumer organizations like which, uh, news organizations, policymakers, politicians, we need to come together because organizations like universities, they need data. If a student goes to a university website and they're just there for a few seconds, the university can step in a, and use a chatbot or something. Oh, we noticed that you stopped on our website. Can we help you? What was it you're looking for? You know, to try and get students. But websites, so I, I think in the future, will, because people are becoming more and more concerned about privacy, those websites that build trust with their users, those will be the ones who give people true informed consent and are more transparent about what's going on beneath. Oh, uh, sorry, Jai, one more. There was in your list of uh, capability or things that collect data, one was AirPods. You mentioned Facebook, Instant3, you know, the different websites, but I saw listed this early on in the talk, AirPods, which you use like for Apple to listen to your computer. Yeah, what about it? So that through the AirPods, they are using, that they're collecting data from those? Uh, I'm not sure. Let me just see where did that come from. Let me just check. Slide uh, early on. You mentioned the different. Um, yeah, at the beginning, you mentioned like Instagram, the years, like Amazon. There was a slide with, you know, Amazon. That wasn't about collecting data. That's how old these companies are. That wasn't about collecting. Uh, okay. That's how, yeah, that's how old the companies are. Yeah, there was a. Uh, okay. Go. Yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, how. Or in other words, the these companies are quite young, really. Well, yeah, that's that slide. Yes, and at the bottom, but but those yeah. were also the companies that we're talking about that do collect data. It so happens. And Apple by collect is is a first is a first party uh, collector. It doesn't pass it on to third parties, though. That's why uh, okay. Facebook are really really upset because uh, Apple's uh, fourteen from fourteen point five iOS platform. Yeah, AirPods is only, well, in 2020, it was, uh, AirPods were four years old. So this was uh, about yeah, the, yeah. yeah, 
this was about the number of years since its launch. Okay, well, I, but I interpret them as the collectors, but you're saying they're first party collectors. No, no, I'm saying yeah. that this was related to what it what the internet was like in the early days okay. before okay. these companies came on board. Okay. I'm just showing that, you know, really what the internet has changed in the last 30 years, really. Right. So, okay. th th so it wasn't like this in the early days of the internet. And those people here who are as old as I am and remember Netscape and uh, those uh, 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 browsers, remember it wasn't like this in those days. Uh, all mm -hmm. this tracking it wasn't like this and it's really uh, you know in the last well, less than 30 years well for me i really think it's like 2004 when facebook came on the scene that's when i think well it really just went crazy in terms of you know taking our data so in other words okay. this okay. Uh, uh what shoshana zuboff uh author of surveillance capitalism and that's what she's calling she says without us uh, really being aware, it just happened really suddenly, this surveillance capitalism online. And it really happened in, in this space when these companies came on board. So it wasn't like this in the early days. Okay, I, I uh, jumped. I made an assumption. No, no, no. So I apologize. Yeah. No, 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 no that's, that's fine. Well, you, the slides, you can have the slides afterwards. So it'll be easier to follow. Yeah, like this in a talk. It, it's, yeah, it's not easy, but there, it's a good question to check. Um, but yeah, you can have the slides afterwards. But it's, um, this was uh, relating to uh, really saying that the internet wasn't always Thank like you. this. So when yeah. did when did this happen? So I would recommend Shoshana Zuboff's book, Surveillance Capitalism. And she's interviewed quite a lot about uh, um, data extraction from the internet on Channel 4 News and many other uh, yeah, media outlets. She's been interviewed. She's uh, Her ideas are, well, they're quite influential. Not, not everybody agrees with her. Uh, what's happened where she's saying it's a world, it's a wild west on the internet, whereas Michael Veal, at uh, University College London saying, no, it's not a Wild West. They are following regulations, but they get around the regulations. For example, legitimate interest to take our data using things like, so they use loopholes. So it's not a Wild West. People are complying with regulations, but they always have loopholes. For example, Google Chrome using incognito mode, pretending that you're browsing in private when you're not when they're spying on you google spying on you so yeah so but anyway there is, it's an interesting book to read shoshana zuboff's uh, surveillance capitalism i think um we're over the half hour of it's all right because i'd like to go and have dinner I have a very early start five o'clock to get to work coventry university in the morning so if i'm allowed to go and have dinner i'll uh, say uh, thank you very much for giving up your evening uh, is that all right john or is yes, that, thank um, you, Huma. Okay. Yes. Thank I'd like you. to thank Huma and James for supporting us tonight with this very interesting talk.